Thanks everyone for joining and thank you uh, Nature's Fair Markets for having me. I'm super excited about this topic. It's a, a passion of mine. Um, I'm just gonna see here. I don't see the next slide button anymore. I'm sure Melissa will hop on. Absolutely. Let me see here. I'll start your presentation for you. Okay, because the start button went away. There we go. It's there. there. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Great. So five ways to reverse insulin resistance and feel great. As I was saying, this topic is really passionate, uh, a passion of mine. Um, I've studied nutrition for 20 years, and I think it's really the root of so many modern day health concerns today is insulin and blood sugar. I think it's so important for us to sort of know where we're at with our blood sugar and everyone's so biochemically unique. Some people could struggle with insulin resistance and some people may not. So it really depends on, on the person and the situation. But uh, I'm gonna go over you know, five ways that uh, we can sort of reverse insulin resistance or even just increase our energy and just feel better. We may not have insulin resistance, uh, we may not have hypoglycemia or we may not be a type two diabetic, but the insulin potential of foods could affect us. So the, you know, the, the high sugars that we're eating create uh, insulin response in the body, and that could cause us to feel sluggish through the day. It could even cause us to not sleep well at night. So we're going to talk about ways that we can feel better. And uh, we're going to go over our morning routine because that is really important. Breakfast, a lot of people wonder when is the most important uh, meal? And is breakfast the most important meal? When is the best time to eat breakfast? body pH and what to eat for lunch. People are always looking for ideas and recipes and some healthy snack swaps. So those are five things we'll go over. And a little bit uh, about me as Melissa already did a really nice introduction. I've been a nutritionist for 20 years and I am a educator with Organica. I'm also a hockey mom. I have two boys. They're 15 and 16 and a half and uh, they're, one of them's coming back from the rink right now, so I'm in Ontario, and uh, I love sports. I've been an athlete my whole life, and I think it's, you know, really important uh, to, to really get the connection between food and mood and food and your energy, whether it's playing sports or just being a parent or going to work each day. Food is really connected to how we feel, so I really love diving in and looking at you know, food and mood and just how it makes us feel. And um, I mentioned earlier about swapping foods and getting some healthy snacks. And I don't like to say, you know, we can't have certain foods. I like to swap, you know, certain ingredients or certain foods and um, just, you know, make it a lifestyle. And we'll talk about that uh, some more today, tonight. So just a really quick uh, one um, overview on Organica and who we are. Uh, I love Organica. It's an amazing company to work for. It's a natural wellness and beauty company from beautiful British Columbia, uh, which is obviously in Canada. We love helping people live healthier lives, and we've been doing it for 30 years. I believe this summer is actually our 32nd anniversary, which is pretty fantastic. It's great to work for a family-owned company as well. And we've grown from a humble line of supplements to an always evolving collection of natural health and beauty products, including Canada's number one selling collagen powder, which we will dive into tonight as well. We are also the fourth recognized brand in Canada, which is pretty exciting because there are so many amazing brands out there. I know Nature's Fair Markets probably has a ton of great brands and it's always nice, uh, you know, to see brands doing well. And it was really nice for us to be recognized as the fourth in Canada. So it's our, our quest to, to guide people to better health through genuine passion for wellness and innovation. And I'm just happy to be here tonight. I'm sure you guys will have lots of, of questions. So I hope we can answer them and have a lot of fun. So five ways to reverse insulin resistance and feel great. As I mentioned, we're going to start with finding your morning routine. So I think that that's really important is how you start your day. Um, it even affects how you sleep at night, believe it or not. So, you know, I always say to my kids, phone down, head up. <laughs> First thing in the morning, if there's one thing we can do, it's not go to our devices, you know, get up, get some fresh air. Even in Ontario, it's been pretty cold here lately, but I always try and open the door and breathe in some fresh air. If you can get outside, wake up a little bit earlier. If you can, you know, go to bed a little bit earlier, even 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes earlier. 
and receive the, the sun. Um, it's so great to do first thing in the morning and just breathe in air before we get, you know, on our devices or in the hustle and bustle of the mornings. So try, try it, try and get up maybe 20 to 30 minutes earlier than you normally would and get in that routine of maybe going to bed 20 to 30 minutes earlier. So you're not fatigued throughout the day. But uh, most importantly, you don't want to rush. Rushing is something that is not good for our stress levels. And we really want to, you know, enjoy the morning and get, you know, into our day. And the fresh air or morning walk or run or some sort of exercise is a great way to start your day. And you can just find a routine that works for you. A lot of people like to meditate, maybe have a coffee or a tea in the morning. Um, but most of all, just make the morning make a routine and make it about you without your cell phones or your electronic devices. Even if it's just for a few minutes, that would be great because you want to get your heart pumping if you can. And um, when you do that first thing in the morning, not only do you feel good and you reduce your stress, but you're breathing in the fresh air, you're creating all these good hormones and endorphins, the feel good hormones, and you actually feel better throughout the day that you did it in the morning. <laughs> so it's really good to get outside and do some sort of, you know, walking or running or whatever you prefer. Um, you really have to enjoy it. If you don't like running, don't do it. <laughs> but um, when you do it first thing in the morning, um, if it's just like, you know, a short little walk or a short run, we, we don't need to eat. We can just do it on an empty stomach, maybe have a glass of water in the morning. But, um, you know, we're just going to use up, you know, for that light exercise, some stored fat, which is great because, um, you know, it's not like we're running a marathon when we really need to make sure we're putting a lot of, um, you know, nutrients back into our body to last us for, you know, four hours. <laughs> this is just a nice little fresh air exercise uh, to get ourselves going in the morning and we can do it on an empty stomach. And the endorphins and adrenaline that you have throughout the day will wake you up, put you in a good mood, and really set the tone for the rest of the day. And it really doesn't hurt to start your day on a good foot, literally. So I'll talk more about, you know, that sort of um, exercising on, in the morning on an empty stomach in a little bit as well. But really finding that routine is really great to do first thing in the morning. So breakfast, is it the most important meal? Well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk about that first. Um, something I wanted to, to do is uh, just do a little drawing on the whiteboard. Um, so I'm going to just activate this board that Melissa has put up here for me. So thank you, Melissa. I'm just going to actually use the pen here. And I just want to make sure you guys can see that little little scale I did there. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So, um, oh, that's perfect. That's even better, Melissa. Thank you. Um, so what, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, um, draw a little circle here. Okay. So this is, um, the cell, just think of this as the human cell. So we have thousands and thousands of cells in our body. And I just want to explain the role of insulin, um, in the cells, just so um, everyone can really understand it before I dive into it. So um, like I mentioned, we have thousands and thousands of cells in our body and every cell has these little receptors. And I'll just put a little four little doors here. This whiteboard is so cool. <laughs> I'm going to put an R in the little doors because there are receptors. They stand for receptors. Okay. There we go. And what happens in our body when we eat a carbohydrate? It could be any carbohydrate. It could be a chocolate bar. It could be a Coca-Cola. It could be a piece of bread. It could be, you know, some fruit, any type of carbohydrate. It'll turn to sugar in our body. So our pancreas uh, is an organ that secretes insulin anytime we have sugar in the body. So if we eat a carbohydrate or a sugar, the carbohydrates turn to sugar and our pancreas, I'm just going to change the color here and be fancy. <laughs> our pancreas shoots out insulin and grabs onto that sugar and takes it through those receptor doors into our cell. Okay, so the red is our insulin. And inside that cell, um, our body naturally changes it into glycogen. I'll just put a G here for glycogen. Okay. So that seems like a pretty simple process, which it is, and our body knows exactly how to do it. 
And um, over time, you know, as we're eating carbohydrates, it turns to sugar, our body knows to pump the exact amount of insulin, take that sugar, grab onto it, bring it through the receptor doors into the cell. In the cell, we turn it into glycogen and we store it in our liver and our muscles for use later. And that's not a problem. It's the way it's supposed to work. What happens is though over time, and we're seeing it now in younger and younger adolescents, even some um, younger um, children, because we're eating so much refined carbohydrates and sugars, a lot of processed foods, our body is constantly producing insulin all day long, right? So we're getting that insulin, grabbing onto the sugar, taking into the cell, getting the insulin, taking into the cell. So it's pumping out insulin more than it should throughout the day. Over time, as we get older, or just as we have a lot of insulin production in the body, these little receptor doors, they almost, they get gummed up. It's almost like putting gum in a keyhole. You can't really get the key in. So our body is still making the insulin. It's just not getting in because our cells are gummed up and that's called insulin resistance. So what's happening with the insulin here? I'm going to switch the color to maybe a blue. <laughs> so this insulin in the body, I'm just going to put these little waves. It's not getting in the cells. So where do they go? Well, they get stored around the middle. I like to call it our insulin meter. Some people call it a uh, muffin top. And uh, that's really what causes insulin resistance. So I really wanted to draw that. Usually if I do this in a classroom setting, I would draw it on a board. So I'm, I'm grateful to have this whiteboard because this is pretty, pretty handy. So I hope you all were able to get a visual there of our cells and the role of insulin in the body, because I just want to realize that um, as, as our um, production of insulin goes up, and those cells start to resist it, that's when we start to gain weight around the middle. So I will go to the next slide. Um, I think Melissa will do it for me. Thank you very much, Melissa. I don't see the slide yet. There we go. Thank you, Melissa. So what happens over time is too much insulin gets stored around the middle. So as, as you know, a muffin top, some people call them love handles, but that's I call it our insulin meter around the middle. So that's where it gets stored. So it's really important to um, make the connection of, okay, hmm, am I eating, you know, too many carbohydrates? Am I feeling sluggish? How is my, my sleep? Because this can be a real struggle for, for people. And um, my dad was a type two diabetic and I was really getting into nutrition uh, just in my, you know, my mid twenties when he was starting to go through the struggles with this. And I remember you know, he had been in and out of the hospital over time. And I remember thinking, well, treating a disease of too much insulin with more insulin just didn't make sense to me. Why don't we just eat foods that have less insulin potential, right? They don't create as much insulin in the body. So that was something that as a holistic nutritionist, I really tried to connect the dots for people. So um, I think it's really important that we really understand the role in the body and how food really does affect how we feel. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. I just see uh, the whiteboard I'm going to use again. So um, thank you, Melissa. So for um, the next slide, I'm just going to use the whiteboard again. And um, I'm going to talk about breakfast. So I'm going to use this as an example. So I'm going to get another color here for the board. I'll just get actually, I'll get black just to draw this is just a little graph. Now, most people in the morning when you get up, it's so common for people to do, if you live in Canada, Tim Hortons drive through <laughs> um, large coffee, double double or a bagel or cereal, or even some people, you know, will have toast or um, something refined. It's just traditionally what we wake up to. And we really want to get out of that habit because that sets us off for a poor day insulin wise. Every time you're going to eat a food, if you struggle with insulin resistance, you want to think, how is this food affecting my insulin potential? So think about that, that um, drawing I just drew. So let's use this as an, as an example. Let's say you get up in the morning and you're gonna take an apple and you're gonna juice it with a juicer. 
So, um, you know, when you put the apple in the juicer, it kicks all the fiber to the back and you get that nice apple juice. Apple juice has some vitamins and minerals in it for sure. And, um, you know, it, it, it does turn to sugar. It's not going to hold us over very long, but I'm just going to switch colors here. I'm just going to draw our blood sugar. So we take that glass of apple juice and we drink it. What happens to our blood sugar? It's going to spike up and then quickly drop down, maybe even lower than it was before. Because it doesn't take very long to drink the apple juice and uh, all that fiber is gone. We're not consuming the fiber because it got kicked to the back of the juicer. So it would be great to consume the fiber if we could. But that blood sugar is gonna spike and we're gonna get a high insulin potential. That's this red arrow, right? So that's a high insulin potential and um, it's not going to sustain us very long. It's not going to hold us over. Now, this is just an example. Um, now, let's say the second day, instead of juicing the apple and drinking the juice, you're going to cut up the apple and eat it with the skin on. Okay, sounds pretty good. But this time you're getting that fiber from the skin. So that's a lot better for us because anytime we add fiber, it sort of buffers that insulin spike. So we eat that apple with the skin on. Our blood sugar will spike because it is a carbohydrate. But because that fiber is there, we're going to have less insulin potential and the apple with the skin on will hold us over a little bit longer. So it's going to sustain us a little bit longer, which means we're going to be fuller a little longer. Now, let's say the third day, we're going to have that apple, we're going to cut, out, cut it up and we're going to put almond butter on it. OK, almond butter has some really good fats in there. It also has some really good protein. So we have the fiber from the skin as well. So we have protein, fat, and fiber. So we're going to eat that and our blood sugar, it's going to spike, but not as much. And our insulin potential, I'm sure you can guess, is going to be less as well. And that apple with the skin on and the almond butter is going to hold us over even longer. So I know apple with almond butter is not, you know, a big meal or anything. I'm just using this as an example. So you know that by adding protein, fat, and fiber to your snacks or meals, you always buffer that insulin spike. So that's something you want to do and it sustains you longer. So if you're just having that juice on its own, it's gonna go through you, blood sugar is gonna spike. And unfortunately, when you start your day with sugar, you end up chasing your hunger all day long. You'll probably find your blood sugar will be, it'll look like this, a roller coaster all day long. And that's when you start to feel those tired moments at two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, because if anyone's, you know, if you have a cheat day where you do, you wake up and you have pancake breakfast or something on a holiday, or sometimes my kids love to do pancakes on Sundays. If I have them, I find all day long, I'm like, Oh, hungry, right? Because that blood sugar just started me off on a bad note. And that's what we want to avoid in the morning for breakfast. So we want to start our day with protein, fat and fiber, because it'll keep our blood sugar even like this. You'll have little dips and stuff throughout the day, but you don't want those drastic ones. Okay, next slide. I'll go back to my presentation. Thank you, Melissa. And I hope those visual visuals were good for you, but I, um, I just like to explain it that way. So the best time to eat breakfast is when it's best for you. So if you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry, you don't need to eat. Um, there's no set time on when we need to break our fast. That's what breakfast is, breaking our fast. It's really up to you. And I, and I think that there's been a lot of research. A lot of people do it different, you know, differently, but um, there's, there's no reason why we can't get up and have some water. Um, you know, some lemon and water is great. And then eat when your body tells you eat when you're hungry. So, and that's great for blood sugar too. I know myself, um, like I was mentioning earlier, if you get up and you go for a walk or you do some exercise in the morning, I have enough stored fat on my body that it can steal, though it can use that that energy. I don't need to eat before I go for a walk in the morning because I do have stored energy, stored fat that my body can use. So, um, you know, unless we're going for, you know, a four hour marathon, that's a different, that's a different uh, situation. But, um, you know, skipping breakfast to do intermittent fasting, that's a big rave right now. Um, I think intermittent fasting is good. It's something, you know, we could definitely dive into another time, but uh, intermittent fasting is good. It's basically when you eat between a window and you guys can, you know, do some research on it as well. And uh, some people may 
they eat their breakfast at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or even noon. It just depends on the person. They may have a coffee in there and coffee doesn't uh, break a fast because there's no carbohydrate or, or protein really in there too much. Uh, it's the carbohydrates you want to watch. But a lot of people have uh, things, you've probably heard of a bulletproof coffee, right? And that kind of um, is really good because you don't get any insulin spike from there. We have at Organica some great products. So one is called Super Brew. It's the, the one on the left. And then we have our Enhanced Collagen MCT Creamer on the right. So what they basically are, are creamers that you add to your coffee. And um, they actually help because they give you energy because the MCT in there gives you energy. And they actually kind of prolong your fast or keep you going until your lunchtime and they're very healthy so the super brew on the left it is a great combination of grass-fed butter uh, mct oil and ghee and um you've probably heard or have tried some bulletproof coffees in the past and that's sort of the ingredients that are similar in there and it gives you good energy as well and it gets you that uh, you know alertness that you would get from the mct and then we have an enhanced collagen mct creamer which is lovely in coffee it's called a boost and you can add that to your coffee as a creamer in it they're both um, the one on the right, the boost is dairy free. So if people are looking for a dairy free MCT creamer, it's got some collagen in there, which has lots of benefits that we'll talk about as well. So um, definitely eat breakfast when you feel you're hungry, listen to your body. And, um, you know, intermittent fasting, if uh, if that's something you try and you like, it's it's definitely really good. There's a lot of research on that for longevity too. That could probably be another webinar on its own. <laughs> but um, just wanted to just reiterate that some people always ask, well, what about coffee? Like, does coffee make you fat? Um, well, no, uh, coffee, you know, on its own, black coffee does uh, create some sort of uh, um, cortisol spike in some people if they're sensitive. And um, what happens is um, the, the, the stress elevates cortisol secretion. So if you have uh, caffeine and it elevates your cortisol secretion, um, that could be an issue for some people. And that's why they would use the super brew with the MCT because it really buffers that cortisol with those good fats in there. So if you're that type of person like myself, if I were to drink a coffee first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, I would feel jittery. Um, so by putting those um, super brews or the MCT enhanced cauldron boosts in there, it sort of buffers that and um, you don't get that effect. But having said that, I will note that um, when we're stressed, because stress elevates cortisol even more, uh, stress is a big factor uh, in health as well. Um, and we're talking about insulin today. So just by um, whenever our body is stressed out, we produce cortisol. So that's our stress hormone. And we don't even have to eat carbohydrates. But when our body produces cortisol, we automatically produce insulin. So it's really important to manage that stress because that equals belly fat, right? Too much cortisol and insulin can add to that insulin meter around the middle. So it's really important if you're drinking coffee, that's fine, you're not sensitive to it, but um, you really wanna watch your blood sugar and your stress because that can contribute to the insulin uh, in the body as well. So let's talk about some, some more about insulin and some blood sugar control um, um, things that we can do. So. There's some great products. You've probably heard of um, Bitter Melon. It is an amazing um, for blood sugar. And uh, it's it's a fruit. It looks kind of looks like a cucumber. It's at the bottom there and it's got those little bumps on it. But um, Bitter Melon has been known for many, many years. It's a and uh, Organica actually has a supplement. It's called Bitter Melon blood sugar control. So it's a combination of bitter melon and chromium to help control blood sugar. So chromium is very good for controlling blood sugar as well. And it's been found to increase uh, insulin sensitivity. So we want our cells to be sensitive uh, to the insulin. We don't want to resist them, right? Sometimes people get confused with that terminology. But um, as I said, the the Bitter melon looks like a cucumber with bumpy skin, and it's the most bitter of all fruits. So it really helps control that blood sugar level. So if you take it before a meal, it's really, really good to help buffer that insulin spike. So those are some tips that people can use. You can even take some really, you know, some really good organic cinnamon and sprinkle that on your food, throw it 
throw it anywhere or throw it in your drinks as well because cinnamon is really good source of chromium and that is uh, is great to add as well because it's really good for blood sugar um, we're going to talk a little bit about digestion as well, because that's kind of um, whenever you, you know, part of the whole um, path of food. So whenever we put food into our mouth, obviously we start chewing and we automatically secrete saliva and that food goes down our esophagus into our stomach. And in our stomach is when the food starts to get churned and broken up. And in our stomach, we have something called hydrochloric acid. And usually by the time we're adults, most adults have what's called an underactive stomach. And what that means is we don't produce enough um, hydrochloric acid, which is um, really good for digestion and breaking our food down so we don't get gassy or bloated. Um, so apple cider vinegar is an amazing tool that you can use before meals. And it really helps with digestion and it has so many great benefits. So, um, um, apple cider vinegar is is from fermented apples and it's natural apple cider vinegar and it's used you know for all kinds of digestive issues but it helps increase the stomach acid that's basically what it does so it helps um, assist in digestion and any bloating flatulence or nausea or any digestive issues and it really helps kind of break down that food in your stomach before it gets moved on into the intestine it actually helps with bowel movements too because it helps break up the food so it has an easier time for the rest of the digestion phase but um, it helps to increase the sense of fullness it causes you to you know ingest less because it's dige uh, digesting your food more uh, more efficiently and um, even though apple cider vinegar is pretty acidic to taste like you can put it on a spoon and take it right before a meal uh, organica also has these awesome cider vin capsules for people that just want to take a capsule but um, you can just have it right before a meal however way you choose and um, it's great uh, for your digestive uh, system. So even though apple cider vinegar is very acidic, some people may not like taking it off the spoon, you could put it in a little water if you wanted. Um, but even though it's acidic to taste, it leaves an alkaline ash, which is very beneficial for body pH. So when we're talking about body pH, um, you know, we want to be neutral. Uh, our body pH can be, you know, more acidic or more alkaline. And um, even though apple cider vinegar is very acidic, it's actually very good for us. Okay. We also, uh, speaking of digestion, um, wanted to touch on some digestive enzymes because a lot of questions come up when I talk about digestion and really the path of food. So when that food goes into the stomach and it gets, you know, turned into what's called a bolus, it's just all the food, you know, swishing around together. Um, a lot of people struggle with digestion and breaking that bolus apart. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have to be very careful with what they eat. And some people even have to avoid certain foods because they can cause stomach pain or they get gassy, uh, constipation and things like that. So enzymes are something that people use to help all uh, with the digestive process as well. So it helps break down protein, carbs and fats, even those complex starches and dairy products um, that help uh, digest better. So if you're one of those people that, you know, doesn't have regular bowel movements, maybe need some help with digestion, um, full spectrum plant enzymes are wonderful because it helps the body utilize other nutrients and minerals. So if you're not digesting your food well, you're not going to be absorbing the nutrients from your food. So you really want to have food as foundation. We want to make sure we're eating well 80% of the time. I, I'm big on the 80-20 rule. So 80% of the time we're eating well, 20% of the time we can cheat and have fun. If you go to that birthday party, have the cake and enjoy it. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people are doing the reverse today. They're eating well 20% of the time and cheating 80% of the time and their digestion is suffering. So you really want to make sure you're helping your body utilize your, your nutrients and your minerals and decrease the ingestion, the indigestion and the feeling heavy after eating, right? And when you're feeling heavy after eating, that can affect your insulin potential as well. And um, you really want to make sure you're digesting your food efficiently and you're eating foods that don't cause too much insulin spike. And that's um, really going to give you a lot of energy and in turn, it'll help you sleep better at night as well. So speaking of apple cider vinegar and being very acidic taste, it brings me to body pH and, and what to eat for lunch. A lot of people ask those questions, you know, um, 
you know, you have, if you have, you know, your breakfast um, in the morning, you're going to focus on your protein, fat and fiber. I love eggs. Eggs are wonderful. They're a complete uh, protein. Uh, make sure you're getting protein of some sort in the morning and really uh, st stay away from those processed carbohydrates and those refined foods because that sets you up for a really good day. If you have your coffee, you can throw in Super Brewer and MCT Creamer. That's going to keep that insulin nice and steady. And then when it comes to lunchtime, what do you want to eat? Well, I have lots of great ideas for lunch. First, we'll talk about body pH because that's really important. So um, pH is an indicator of acidity or alkalinity and then the overall health of your body. So you guys have probably seen this pH scale back in grade 10 science, <laughs> if it can bring you back. But um, the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. So 0 is more acidic and alkaline um, uh, sorry, 14 is more alkaline. And um, our body always strives to be in balance, which is neutral. It's about uh, 6.4 to 7.4. Our body will usually stay in that range. And um, if you score higher than seven, then your body's more alkaline. And if you score lower than seven, your body's more acidic. So the key is when we're more acidic, we're more of a host for disease. So um, not to say we're not going to ever we want to have acidic foods. We just don't want to have too many of them. We want to make sure we're balancing the alkaline foods with them. Okay. So the question that comes up a lot is, well, what foods are good to eat? Well, diet is great to balance our bodies. So if you think of your dinner plate, 75% should be alkalinizing foods and 25% should be acidic forming foods. So if you have some chicken or fish or meat, um, those are a little bit more acidic forming, uh, and I dairy and uh, some other foods are very acidic forming doesn't mean you can't have them, but you want to make sure you're getting your greens and your good um, green leafy vegetables uh, throughout the day to make up that other 75%. So while you need to consume foods from both categories, you really want to make sure you need more alkalinizing foods than acidic foods to keep super healthy. So a great habit for lunchtime is to get into adding, you know, lots of greens to your lunches. I love um, adding lemon or lime to your water. You could do it first thing in the morning. It's great for pH and you can do it throughout the day as well. Um, and again, like apple cider vinegar, lemon is very acidic as well, but it's so good for us because it leaves what's called an alkaline ash um, after it's digested. So it's very alkalinizing for our body pH even though it tastes very acidic. So greens are great to add in through the day to alkalinize the body. One thing that I do with my kids is I usually try and have vegetables every week and I usually just chop them up whenever I have a chance and like have them on the counter. So after school, they can just grab them and sometimes I'll do a hummus, sometimes I'll do different dips, but it's just, and they'll eat, they'll, eat, I'll put their favorite vegetables and they'll eat it because they eat a lot right now because they're teenagers. And um, I'll usually always make vegetables with dinner too. And I, you know, sometimes I'll take some in their lunch, but I find that if I just have them um, on the counter sitting there, people will walk by and eat them. So that's a, a nice habit I, I get into and it works really well for us. Um, just to show you a little chart here of the alkalinizing foods and acidic forming foods. And of course, there's there's way more. I just wanted to show you guys. So the alkalinizing foods, something like chlorella, ACV, which is apple cider vinegar, spirulina, which we'll get into, lemons, asparagus, fermented veggies, beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, all kinds of lettuces, garlic. These are all alkalinizing and very good for us. And of course, the acid forming foods, which we can like um, consume foods like beef, grains, dairy. It's just we don't want to have too many of them, right? And of course, the grains are very um um, a higher carb. So if you're very sensitive and you're trying to reverse some insulin sensitivity, you want to really watch the grains, right? If you're having a dinner plate, I might not have a whole plate of rice or, or grains. You may have just a quarter of the plate and more greens, right? Because that rice has a real high insulin potential. Pastas, breads, all those foods have a really high insulin potential. So you want to make sure you're balancing and adding that protein, fat, and fiber whenever you're having maybe some carbohydrates that are not so great and you want to limit the amount of them as well. So you can just see those alkalinizing foods are something that we can add in. And you could, you know, probably Google some get a lot more um, 
foods that are alkalinizing as well. But Organic has a, a few products that are just amazing and um, they're really good at just adding in um, and maybe swapping some not so great things out. So all, chlorella is um, a great type of algae and it's super, super healthy. It's sometimes called a seaweed, but it's used for nutrition. So you can see in the picture there, there's powder and there's tablets. So um, you could use either or, but it's one of the most nutrient dense superfoods on the planet. So it's a great source of protein. It has minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants. So for those of us that are um, experiencing some insulin resistance or we're sensitive, um, we really need nutrients. We need, really need vitamins and minerals and greens just to really help heal the cells because our, our cells have been really tired, right? They're gummed up with um, um, that insulin because the receptor doors aren't letting the insulin in and you really need to heal the cells. So as you start cleaning out your diet, that those cells will start to clean out and you really want to nourish those cells with some good foods. And chlorella is one of those uh, antioxidants that are great for oxidative stress, even cancer. It's a great source of protein, minerals, and um, antioxidants. And it actually, it acts like a sponge. So any toxins or junk in your body, think of it as a sponge that just soaks it all up and then you know, you rid it through your bowels. So it's a really great tool to use. Um, and um, it's an algae. And we um, there's also a spirulina, which is an algae. And sometimes people get confused. So I'm going to talk about the spirulina as well. But spirulina is a type of algae as well. And it's really high in protein and B vitamins and um, some antioxidants as well. But it can be difficult to get from other foods in your day-to-day -day diet. So um, spirulina is really good because it's grown on fresh water and gets lots of sunlight. And it's an algae as well. And it, it, um, it doesn't have a tough exterior wall. So chlorella has a tougher exterior wall. It almost looks like you know, when a shrimp has the case, the kind of the shrimp shell on it, well, the chlorella, chlorella goes through processing where it breaks down that cell wall so we can absorb it really well. Spirulina doesn't have that. So it doesn't have that tough exterior and it's very easy to digest. So um, think of chlorella kind of more of a detoxifier, cleaning out your cells, has some protein and antioxidants and spirulina kind of more of a multivitamin with some B vitamins and protein as well. You can definitely use them together or choose one or the other, but um, it's, they're really great for an easy way to get a bunch of nutrients in a single supplement. So there's so many things you can do with it. You can sprinkle it on salads. You can do a lot just to kind of sneak those nutrients in there. And uh, I have a little recipe here. Feel free to take a snapshot with your phone, but it's um, a great recipe for salad dressing. So of course, when I make salads, you can put whatever's, you know, wilting in your fridge, whatever you need to use up, throw it together for a big salad, and then just get a mason jar, put some chopped garlic, put any really good oil that you have, like a hemp seed oil, flaxseed oil, avocado oil, um, red wine vinegar or apple cider vinegar, um, and some chlorella or spirulina powder and some sea salt and just shake it up and use that as your salad dressing. So um, the sea salt is a great electrolyte as well. And electrolytes are really important for our cells and um, our, our just our chemical uh, reactions within the body. So that's a great salad that you can use for lunch. You could add some chicken, some protein, but um, I've been using this one for many, many years and it's really good, just a healing salad. And um, I almost have a salad like this every day whether it's for lunch or for dinner and it's just it tastes so good and you can change it up a little bit and play with it but all the ingredients in there are very healing and the sea salt is a really good source of electrolyte as well which we need some people um, are doing um, you know different diets like the keto diet is really popular right now and it's where you're restricting the amount of carbohydrate carbohydrates you're consuming and um, it uh, it's really good for lowering insulin um, or your um, fasting insulin. Some people get their fasting insulin tested from their doctor and they they realize, okay, um, my fasting insulin is not very good and it's a good tool to get that tested through your doctor just to know where you're at. And um, some people will try the keto diet or not even the keto diet and just lower their carbohydrates. And when you do that, 
you want to make sure you're getting electrolytes. And I think everyone needs electrolytes every day. Anyways, I always start, um, have electrolytes in the morning and um, it's essential for our cells and for our organs to work properly. So um, when your body's low on electrolytes, you just don't feel well, right? Um, you could have, you know, must, you know, sometimes at night when you have the calf cramps and things like that, it's really important uh, to get enough electrolytes and it's really good for fluid regulation. So, um, most of the population has lower electrolytes like potassium deficiency and magnesium deficiency. Magnesium is a wonderful supplement that we need. It does so many things in the body. So um, it's really important to make sure we're getting those electrolytes every day um, because some sometimes people you know, don't feel well, they feel nauseous, and they don't realize, oh, they just need electrolytes, you know, it's not a flu, and they're not sick, they just need more electrolytes. So um, Organica has these fabulous electrolytes that taste amazing. Um, I just love them because they're zero sugar. There's so many electrolytes out there. And I look at the packages, I'm like, no, I don't want the sugar, I just want the electrolytes. So this is fabulous. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. It's uh, zero sugar. There's also five grams of grass fed collagen. So that's protein, that's way you can sneak in some protein, right? buffer that insulin spike throughout the day. And there's no sugar, so you're not going to get an insulin spike. It's, um, you got some vitamin C in there. It's totally caffeine free, so you can have it any time of day. It's non-GMO, gluten-free, keto friendly for those that are keto. There's no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, and it really helps balance the acid alkaline pH level, which we want to do. That's how we nourish our cells, you know, put those good nutrients back in as we're cleaning our cells out. So um, I just want to touch on some healthy snack swaps now. So um, I gave you some ideas for breakfast. You want to make sure you're having that protein, fat, and fiber. Make sure if you're having coffee, you can put some of those uh, um, super brews or those enhanced collagen boosts in there. And then hopefully your blood sugar has been pretty good throughout the day. And if you're having snacks or you're having meals, um, some things that are great is, uh, you know, swap out that afternoon coffee or pop or juice or latte or whatever it is with uh, nourishing bone broths from, um, you know, from chicken or beef. Uh, they are so nourishing. And I've been getting in the habit of having uh, bone broth tea at around three o'clock in the afternoon. And people have been making bone broth for centuries. I always make it at Christmas time or at Thanksgiving because they're so good. Uh, and so nourishing, right? Um, and it's made by boiling the chicken or beef bones for 24 hours, and then the bones are strained from the broth. So it's a great tool. And um, because people can't be, you know, making bone broth every single day, I can't anyways, Organica has some really good dried broth powders, which are amazing, because they're so rich in protein and collagen. And you can take them anywhere. So they're, they're powder. So you can, you can have them uh, in your pantry. You can take them when you travel and you can use them. So they're so good because they're, like I said, they're rich in protein and collagen, gelatin, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin, so many minerals uh, like magnesium, sodium, potassium, and, and phosphorus. So it's a great way to swap out something at three o'clock. Usually I used to work in a, in corporate in a company, like in my early twenties and, um, at three o'clock, everyone ran down to the vending machines, right, to get a pop or a bag of chips or a snack or something just to get us to five o'clock. So it's a great way to swap out that unhealthy snack in the afternoon. And you're getting so much protein. Um, there's about 12 and sometimes 16 grams of protein per serving in, in a broth. So it's a great tool. You just put, um, you know, two tablespoons in a big mug and some hot water. I add a little bit of sea salt and it tastes awesome. You can sprinkle bone broth uh, on your vegetables when you're stir frying. I cook with it. I put it in soups. I put it in uh, crock pot recipes and really even just sipping on it uh, throughout the day or even in, in the morning for some people is so wonderful for leaky gut because the collagen in there helps heal our gut. So lots of great things you can use it for. Um, I love recipes. So please feel free to take a picture of this recipe with your phone. It is a dairy-free butter chicken recipe. So I've been making this for over 10 years. I've been with Organica almost three years. So I started using the Organica turmeric chicken bone broth and adding that when I started with Organica and it kicked it up a notch for sure. So it's very spicy, the turmeric chicken bone broth. If 
if you don't love spice, use the regular chicken bone broth. Um, but it tastes amazing. And um, this is just a great recipe. I do it in a crock pot and my kids love it. It's super, super hearty. It's great because it's got super low insulin potential. Sometimes my kids like it over rice and they can handle that. I don't. I just um, throw some spinach in there and eat it on its own. And almost like the liquid is almost soupy as well. And, it, and it's really filling. It's, it's really good. Sometimes I'll even... Um, add some cauliflower, like some steamed cauliflower, and it's, it's a really good way to have it. Um, so I was talking about the chicken and the beef bone broth. So we also have a wonderful um, veggie broth uh, from Organica, and it is awesome. It is um, really, really nourishing. And uh, for those vegetarians that may not eat uh, or consume chicken or beef, so there's four grams of protein from the veggie broth. So please take a picture of, of this as well, if you like. And um, it's just a great way to, um, you know, swap out some of those other um, snacks or drinks that we might have throughout the day. So um, I've talked a little bit about bone broths and veggie broth. And a lot of people always think, okay, I understand. But uh, you talked about collagen in the bone broth. What's the difference between collagen and bone broth? So I will dive into that right now. I did talk about how the collagen is a great source of protein. Uh, sorry, the bone broth is a great source of protein. And it does have collagen in there. When you take your turkey out of the fridge, say the day after Thanksgiving or the day after Christmas, you notice how it's kind of all that jelly, all the liquid uh, it kind of gets like jelly. Well, that's collagen. That's all the good stuff. You want to like save, save all that. Um, but um, that's, that's collagen. So there is collagen in bone broth, but you're also getting lots of minerals and um, lots of vitamins and minerals as well in the bone broth. So um, I even, when my kids were toddlers, gave them uh, bone broth in a lukewarm, sip, a lukewarm in a sippy cup because it's so good for developing bones and teeth and everything. So that's another tip if you if you have toddlers, if you know anyone with toddlers, it's it's a great drink to have instead of um, juice, right? So many kids are having too much juice. So um, that's a good tip to have for the toddlers. But um, moving on to collagen. So collagen is the most abundant form of protein in the body. It gives our body strength, elasticity, tone, and essential structure. And although we may think of collagen only in our skin, it can be found throughout our bodies. It's in the muscle fibers and bone matrix. It's in our blood vessels. It's really the protein responsible for strong and flexible connective tissues. So I think of it as a glue that keeps everything together. So it's a fantastic way to increase the nutritional content of snacks and meals as well. So if you're looking to add more protein, collagen is a great source of protein. And most adults don't get enough protein in their diet. And uh, we're getting way too many carbohydrates, right? Too much sugar. So if that's you, if you see yourself in that picture, you may want to, um, you know, make sure you're eating some good protein, fat and fiber in your diet. And you can also sneak in. Uh, collagen is a food source, right? So um, collagen is so fabulous for so many things. And it it's noticed in many signs of aging. So you can notice it when we are lacking collagen, fine lines and wrinkles, brittle nails, cellulite, sagging skin, loss of moisture. We can have weak ligaments, aching joints, arthritis, cartilage injuries. So collagen is responsible for so many things in the body. It's not just hair, skin, and nails. It's in our, our joints and our gut as well. So we'll really start to notice that we're lacking collagen if we experience these, these symptoms. And usually in our 20s is when we start to decline. Our collagen declines 1% a year in our 20s. So um, I was actually surprised to learn that. But um, as we get older, um, I, I didn't start using collagen until my 40s. And I noticed um, a huge improvement. So of course, we can use it at any age. But you can just uh, note that we do start to lose it in our 20s, which is unfortunate. <laughs> But um, there's lots of questions always around collagen. So I'm going to go over the main types of collagen and the most common that you'll see in your body. So usually you'll see types one, two, and three um, when you're shopping for collagen supplements. Um, there's over 27 types of collagen, but the main types are types one, two, and three. So type one you'll see um, in our hair, skin, and nails. Think of it as the exterior of our body. That's where it comes from. Type two is the it comes from the connective tissue, so joints, ligaments, and cartilages. 
And then type three is muscle fibers and organs like liver, lungs, and kidneys. So type one, two, and three, you've probably heard that before. Um, supplemental collagen is mainly found as type one as well as po both type one and three. But um, generally how collagen is sourced plays a role in the type that is extracted. So for example, if bovine is sourced from the hides of cattle, it's naturally high in type one collagen. And here's a chart to the right with the common types of collagen supplements and how they're sourced. So I just love looking at this chart. I looked at it a lot um, when I first started with Organica um, because I found it very helpful. So if you look at um, bovine collagen, it's sourced from the hides of cattle and it's high in type one and three collagen. If you look at marine collagen, it's sourced from fish scales and Organica sources it from cod and uh, it's from fish scales and skin, and it's a type one collagen only. If you're looking at chicken, it's the sternum bones and cartilages, and that's a type two collagen. So that's from your bone broth that I talked about earlier. So um, that'd be a chicken bone broth. So what makes a collagen supplement great? Well, before you can try or commit to any collagen supplement, you have to do your research. Like I said before, I'm really big on the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time if we're eating well, 20% of the time we can celebrate, have fun, cheat. You know, if we can handle that, that's great if we're not sick. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of people, they're not doing the research. So my kids eat a lot of bananas. So I buy organic bananas. They use them in their smoothies. They make banana boats. They do lots of stuff with them. So I do buy organic bananas because we use them a lot. If you're going to use collagen every day, please make sure you're, you're doing your research and you're getting a clean source. Remember, not all collagen products are the same. Collagen, like I said, has so many benefits and we wanna make sure that you reap those benefits. So you get the cleanest source possible. So here's a few important factors to think about when you choose your collagen. So 100% hydrolyzed, this is great. It's the process of breaking it down into a smaller molecule. So it's called a peptide as well. You've probably see, seen or heard of that before. So a peptide and hydrolyzed collagen mean the same thing. The process actually makes it most bioavailable. And what bioavailable means it's most absorbable. Okay, so it's absorbed really well into the bloodstream and it's used to the body to help with collagen formation. So like I spoke about digestion earlier, if we're digesting really well, we're going to absorb our nutrients from our food and our supplements really well. So you want to make sure that process of digestion is working smoothly. So that food that comes in, that collagen, whatever we're consuming, salads, chicken, all that gets digested really properly. Because if it doesn't get digested properly, we're not going to absorb the great benefits from it. Um, um, when, sorry, I just wanted to mention one other thing. When a product is 100% hydrolyzed, it is also odorless and flavorless. So a lot of people ask that question, is it odorless and flavorless? So yes, if it's 100% hydrolyzed, it will be odorless and flavorless. Organicas is definitely 100% hydrolyzed. Sourcing is really important. Um, so it's sustainably sourced, grass-fed, pasture-raised, free of growth hormones, antibiotics, heavy metals, and toxins. Again, if you're having this every day, like I have it a couple times a day, you want to make sure it's tested for this as well as tested for GMOs. Choose a collagen that is flavorless and odorless. So as I mentioned before, because ours is hydrolyzed, 100% hydrolyzed, uh, some collagens on the market don't taste that great. Um, a good, clean, 100% hydrolyzed collagen should have no flavor or taste, and it should be heat stable. So you can add it to your coffee. You can add it to your smoothie. You can pretty much add it to anything. My mom is 76, and she adds it to her oatmeal in the afternoon. She always has a snack with this, um, some almonds and, and some other things in there. She adds her collagen because um, it adds the protein and it buffers that insulin spike. And um, she loves her oatmeal, so she just makes sure she blends that in there um, to help that. So you really wanna make sure a flavorless and odorless collagen can fit into your lifestyle easily. So, you know, like I said, hot coffee, cold liquids, foods, anything you can bake with it, and it's super, super versatile. Um, Organica has the number one selling collagen powder in Canada. I think it's the fourth year we've got that award. So we're super proud of that. Uh, compliant with Health Canada's regulations. We have um, nine grams of protein, actually 
10 grams now of protein per serving, which is great. It's a great starting point if you haven't tried collagen. Um, to get that 10 grams in one serving is awesome. Depending on the person, we all need different amounts of protein per day. But as I said earlier, most people don't get enough. So um, the enhanced collagen is grass-fed bovine pasture raised and a blend of type 1 and 3. It's free of added hormones and antibiotics. It's of course flavorless and odorless, and it can be added to any hot or cold drink or recipe. It's super easily soluble. That's because it has a low molecular weight, 2000 to 3000 Daltons compared to marine collagen. So what that basically means is that ours is really absorbable for our body. Um, we also have a fantastic product called Enhanced Collagen Relax. So it's the same as our original collagen I was just speaking with, speaking about, but we've added some magnesium, bisglycinate, and L-theanine, which is super exciting. It's two great relaxation supporting nutrients. So magnesium, of course, I, it's wonderful. Um, Nature's Fair Markets probably has so many amazing magnesium brands on their shelf. And um, you can get a little bit of magnesium in this enhanced collagen to take with your current magnesium supplement. And you're also getting the relaxation of the L-theanine. L-theanine is great actually to add because it gives you that alert calm. It actually gets rid of the jitters from um, if people are sensitive to coffee. Coffee, and the collagen supports skin hydration, your texture. It's also great for joints and um, supports your gut because collagen is fantastic for gut health and weight management. Because the collagen has a good source of protein in there, that's going to buffer that insulin spike, right? Anytime we can add in some protein, fat, and fiber, we're going to buffer that insulin sp spike and we're really going to help with our insulin and that. Um, you know, that insulin meter around the middle, because uh, that's what we want to do is we want to have the energy um, and have our blood sugar stable. We don't want to be chasing our hunger all day long. So how much collagen do I need every day? Everyone is different. As I mentioned at the bottom, you can see your body weight in kilograms times 30%. Uh, 10 grams, one serving of collagen is a great starting point. If you're new, um, I do about two servings per day. If you were an elite athlete, maybe a breastfeeding mom, they need more protein. So collagen is a great way to get more protein and have all those added benefits of hair, skin, nail, joint and gut health support as well. So everyone is different, but uh, one serving is a great starting point. And think of it as a food. It's like a food. So, um, you know, spread it out throughout the day and uh, you're going to absorb it a lot better that way as well. Here's another recipe. Uh, speaking of the Relax Enhanced Collagen, feel free to take a picture of this. This is yummy. I tried this one and it is so good. Um, and it tastes, it's really nourishing. So take a picture of that. Hopefully if you guys wanna try it, you uh, can try it. It is uh, really tasty. I encourage you guys, um, you know, in, if, you, if you're on Instagram, uh, Organica Health has lots of awesome recipes as well. I'm gonna move on to the marine collagen. So this would be our type one collagen, as I mentioned before, and this is fish. You can see the little fish at the bottom to the right of the 250 gram. Our um, type one collagen is a marine collagen sourced from cod. And if, you know, if you're looking for a really good collagen and your main concern is hair, skin and nails, this is your go-to. Um, marine collagen is great for hair, skin and nails. It's great for absorption. Um, it's wild caught fish. Like I said, it's from cod. It's Canadian source type one collagen, flavorless and odorless as well. There's no fishy taste for real. And you can add it to anything, hot or cold drinks, smoothies, any foods, and it's super clean. So non-GMO, antibiotic free, keto friendly, pescatarian. So if people don't eat, um, you know, beef or um, and they don't want the enhanced collagen, the marine collagen would be a great benefit for them. And we also have um, a full spectrum collagen type one, two, and three, which is pretty exciting because uh, as I was mentioning before, um, what's the difference between collagen and bone broth? Well, they are a little bit different. Um, as I mentioned, bone broth is a type two collagen and um, what our full spectrum collagen has combined all three, which is pretty exciting. So if you can see from the, the, the container, you can see it says bovine collagen. So we have 40% bovine collagen 40% marine collagen and 20% chicken bone broth. So 
This will have a very slight chicken bone broth flavor. So unlike our, our marine and our enhanced collagen and our enhanced collagen relax that are totally flavorless, because we've added the bone broth, you will get a very slight flavor. Um, but I've mixed it in smoothies and so many other things. It just takes on the flavor of the smoothie. But if you did have it on its own, maybe with some hot water, you would taste a little bit of bone broth, just so you know. But if you're looking for, you know, a good bang for your buck and you want that hair, skin and nail, that joint, that gut health, all that, full spectrum collagen may be a good one for you. And it does have that light chicken bone broth flavor, but it's a great one um, that combines all three of the collagens. Um, and that just brings me, wow, to the end. I can't believe uh, how quickly that hour went. Um, I'm going to uh, just check over with Melissa and see if there's any questions. I feel like I just breezed through that pretty quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, we do have quite a bit of questions coming in, actually. Great. So let's do a little bit of a rapid fire for everyone. Um, actually, before we get started, I should let everyone know that we do have a wellness day sale mm -hmm. coming up on March 4th and 5th, so next weekend. And we're doing 15% off all vitamins, supplements, and um, our beauty products as well, so skincare and uh, cosmetics. And I know you're talking about the Organica bone broth, so a little secret tidbit, um, that's going to be one of our door crasher deals, so they're, they're going to be a really, really good price, so... Come on down, March 4th and 5th. Okay, let's do this. Let's do these questions. Um, all right, this is from the, the very, very beginning. So this person is asking how they lower their blood blood pressure when the meter goes off. Mm -hmm. Well, blood pressure is a little bit different than blood sugar. Um, definitely, that would be a, a question for their doctor, not knowing their health history. But... Um, I'm not too familiar with the blood pressure meters and in that. So that would be a good question for the doctor. Do you want to jump in and maybe could you answer the blood sugar maybe possibly? Yeah. So how do we lower the, the blood sugar? Yeah. Yeah. So um, lowering the blood sugar is uh, will help with blood pressure as well. Um, because anytime we have high blood pressure, we usually have some high insulin uh, as well. So making sure you're starting your day with protein, fat, and fiber. As I mentioned, you really want to think about the food choices that you're making. You want to stay away from those processed foods that turn to sugar very quickly and have a high insulin potential. Gotcha. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you, you touched on this a little bit earlier on, but just so we can get back to it here. What do you think about fasting or keto to help with reversing insulin resistance? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that um, keto definitely works. You just have to make sure, you know, if you're talking to your doctor or a naturopathic doctor, um, if you have any questions and they can, you can share your health history with them. But um, fasting is wonderful. I mean, fasting has been around for years. Intermittent fasting is, is really popular right now. Um, and that's just basically, I touched on that with the eating breakfast when you feel you're ready. Sometimes people will have a fasting um, you've probably heard of a 16 and eight where they're eating for eight hours a day. And then of course you sleep at night and then you might delay your breakfast. You may not have breakfast at six or 7 a.m. You may wait till 10 or 11. And that's, that's, there's definitely benefits to that because um, as a society, we do eat too much. That's my opinion. <clears throat> I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, um, this person, they lost their spleen and gallbladder from a motorcycle accident mm -hmm. and including a third of their liver. Is there anything that they should be doing differently? Any any diet they should be following or any suggestions for uh, reducing insulin resistance? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, because you have your gallbladder removed, our gall gallbladder is responsible for um, secreting bile when we um, eat fats. And um, I would recommend um, for anyone that has had their gallbladder removed, having a really good digestive enzyme, like I, I, I mentioned, uh, before meals, because um, you don't have that gallbladder there to secrete the bile. So the digestive enzymes will serve that purpose. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, this one's going back to the diagram that you did beforehand. Um, okay. They're asking if insulin resistance PCOS, is it the same as a, a, the diagram that you drew? 
So that's a great question. So PCOS is um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and that is um, usually uh, from insulin resistance. So um, usually people that have high insulin, not always, um, usually people that have PCOS can usually get some relief from managing their blood sugar. Yes. Got you. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on putting collagen in uh, this person? I think you did touch on this though, in coffee. Does that yep. make a difference or? Yes, so it does make a difference, uh, not taste wise, because as I mentioned, it's uh, odorless and flavorless, but uh, nutrition wise, for sure, you're gonna get all those benefits for uh, your hair, your skin, your nails, your joints, your gut health, but you're also gonna get that protein, right? So that protein, you're getting 10 grams of protein. So if I'm having a coffee <clears> in the <throat> afternoon and I add that protein, that's gonna keep my blood sugar even. And that's what we want. We don't want to be chasing our hunger all day long and be on that roller coaster ride with blood sugar. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, next up, which one would be better for digestion? Um, is that apple cider or enzymes di digestion? Yeah. Um, so apple cider vinegar will be good um, because uh, it's good for um, break, it's a good acid for breaking down uh, foods. If you are looking, you know, specifically to help with carbohydrates or fats or proteins, you may want to use the full spectrum plant-based enzymes before gotcha. a meal. Yeah. And I know Elisa actually answered this question, but um, mm -hmm. I added it to this, this part as well. Great. What are some alkalizing proteins? Oh gosh. Yes. So um, that's a tough one um, because Protein is usually acid forming. Um, so beef will be more acid forming than fish and chicken. Um, but most, most proteins, um, even eggs are a little bit acid forming, but they're good for you. So um, most alkalinizing foods, like there's some, they could range right on the scale. So beef would be probably the highest. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, can chlorella and spirulini be found in a natural form rather than pills or powder? Well, yes. I mean, um, it's, I don't think you, our spirulina is sourced from Mongolia and it, it's, um, you know, the, the process is, is so clean and it's, uh, it's done in sunlight. And I think that you can't, like you couldn't, you could pick spirulina up if you found it and eat it, but the chlorella, you wouldn't be able to because it has that cell wall that needs to be, it goes through a process of um, being broken down so we can absorb it. So you couldn't eat chlorella without it being processed first. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, I, you know what, this next question, I, I do get the same thing as well with apple cider vinegar. How come you can feel sick after drinking it? Yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, so I quickly touched on if people have an underactive stomach, which a lot of adults do as we get older, that means we're not producing enough acid in our stomach. Some people can have what's called an overactive stomach and not very many do, but you can do a test. You can take some apple cider vinegar, say you take a tablespoon or I would say a teaspoon, start with. If you feel sick, you're good. You don't need, you don't need it. Great. Yeah. Um, have you heard of fibromyalgia being connected to insulin resistance? Um, I have heard of, yes, uh, fibromyalgia been connected to insulin resistance because insulin resistance creates a lot of inflammation in the body. Um, I, you know, and of course, you know, people would have to speak to the doctor because not knowing, you know, what type or what the history is. But um, inflammation is the root of a lot of things and insulin resistance is the root of so many things. So I think, you know, we do what we can, but I think the foundation of many modern day health concerns today, like our inflammation and insulin resistance. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, what about sugar substitutes like stevia and others? Are they good for insulin resistance? Yeah, so stevia is an herbal-based sweetener, which doesn't affect our blood sugar, so it's great. It's safe for diabetics, too. Um, of course, you want to stay away from all the artificial sweeteners, um, like aspartame and those, because um, they're chemicals and they're not good for us. But stevia and things like that are, are great to use. Um, they don't affect your blood sugar. And um, sometimes if, you know, I always say, if you want to use a little stevia in your baking and, you know, it's a great substitute, 
But as you start cleaning out your diet and you start detoxifying, things will start to taste sweeter and sweeter. So you won't need as much as you yep. start detoxifying clean. So definitely you can use stevia as a tool. It's definitely safe. It's natural and it's fine to use. Yep, definitely. How long do you have to use collagen before you see benefits? Yeah, so everyone's different. I can say for myself, I noticed probably in uh, three weeks. Nice. Yeah. Um, what about legumes and beans? Are they good for insulin resistance, even though they are carbs? Yeah, so they're more natural, so they're not as processed or refined. Some people are sensitive to beans and legumes, but um, if 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 you're eating them, just make sure you're combi combining them with some, some protein, some fat, and some fiber. So they are carby, but um, I always say mother nature gets it right. Human intervention gets it wrong. If it's natural and it's grown on the ground, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, thoughts on kombucha and the connection to insulin resistance? Yeah, so I guess with kombucha, just look to see the sugar, right? If there's too much sugar, um, maybe steer away from those ones. Kombucha is fermented, has lots of good benefits, right? For sure. Um, so yeah, just watch the sugar, but kombucha I know is, is great for the gut. It's, you know, fermented. So, so many great properties there. Gotcha. Um, mm. this one is my biggest question is what is my fill food? If I should avoid processed carbs and filling on carbs. So what is my fill food like to fill me up? I, I'm assuming so. Yeah. 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 So I guess, um, I guess I'll say if you start your day, like try this when you have your breakfast. Okay. If people can eat eggs, right. Have three eggs. There's approximately 25 grams of protein in three eggs. Okay. I love eggs. If you can eat them with the yolk runny, that's even better. Um, but, um, you'll find that what you eat in the morning, right? Maybe you make a protein shake or something, but watch that you, like, I can't put a banana in my protein because it's too much insulin potential for me, right? I'll do berries instead because berries have a lower insulin potential. So you kind of have to practice. But if you start with three eggs, if you can eat eggs, that's a great protein. You're starting your day great. And you'll find that people traditionally think of food fillers as like carbs and bread and stuff because back in you know years ago with in during the war people would have bread and flour and that was filler food for if there was no food but um that really has a high insulin spike so if you're just sticking to some real foods from mother nature you're going to have fiber in there you're going to have good fat so work on eating some real food you know like maybe start your day with eggs and make sure you're getting protein fat and fiber through the throughout the day and you won't have those um, blood sugar spikes that make you feel like you need more and you need to fill yourself. So we actually eat way more food when our blood sugar's on a roller coaster ride. Yep. Like yep. I think I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes if we have a cheat day, my kids make pancakes, I'll eat pancakes. And the rest of the day I'm like in the cupboard, like I could eat all day long. Right. Because I started my day with sugar. But if I have started a day with say three eggs, I'm like, Oh, dinner I'm not even hungry but okay let's make dinner you know so you really notice how your blood sugar starts to influence your your food choices mm -hmm. uh, next up I add collagen to bone broth is that too much no that's wonderful there's so many benefits to both with the bone broth you're getting the type 2 collagen which is great and uh, it's so good for gut health you're getting the minerals and it's great for joints and uh, you're getting some collagen in there. And then collagen is wonderful as well. So I do the same. Great. Mm -hmm. How can we support our pancreas? So, um, you know what? Uh, just, you know, keep your insulin in check, right? Um, eat real food from Mother Nature and make sure you're not on that roller coaster ride because we, you know, today we are producing a lot of insulin. Our pancreas is getting a lot of hits all day long. So give it a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not a question, but yes, Wendy, collagen will be included in the sale. All right, I think. Um, I think that might be it. Let me see. Oh, okay, we've got a couple more I'm going to answer, or a couple more sure. that Jolene's going to answer. Sure. Um, is it good to exercise and be active a bit after eating each meal or snack? 
will that help with insulin resistance? Yeah. So eating, um, I've heard that before too, or go for a walk after dinner and it, it's, it's great to it gets your body moving and you'll definitely be burning some, uh, some food as well. And uh, it's great for insul insulin resistance, but I would say do it before, do it first thing in the morning. As I mentioned at the beginning, that's even better. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we've got another one coming up here. How many good carbs would be recommended for an insulin resistant person? Like how many per day? Say? Per day. Geez, it really depends on the person. Uh, but um, if you're trying to lower your insulin resistance or heal it, you know, some doctors, uh, naturopathic doctors will say, start with under 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. If people are doing keto, they're doing under 20 grams per day. So um, I would say a good place to start would be under 50. Uh, talk to your doctor for sure. And just make sure there's no health concerns or anything if you wanted to lower that. But um, you know, food is a foundation, make sure more than anything, you're eating real food. Like I said, mother nature gets it right. Human intervention gets it wrong. So mm -hmm. eat real food first and you'll probably um, do, you'll, you'll have a lot of benefits there. And um, you know, if you, you start at 50 grams, that, that's good, but definitely talk to your doctor and get some, you know, recommendations there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you reverse type two diabetes? So uh, I, my opinion is that you can, and I've seen it done. Yeah. Nice. My dad was a type two diabetic. I learned a lot <laughs> and uh, I've helped, you know, like there's so many things we can do naturally and uh, yeah, just reach out to your doctors, naturopaths. There's lots of, lots of stuff you can do. Um, the two products that you were talking about for coffee, the Organica ones, um, mm -hmm. can you revisit them quickly? Just tell yeah. us what they are about and yeah. This person, their coffee is acidic to their stomach and wondering if these products would help that. Yeah. Is it okay if I flip back to the slide or? Yeah, of course. Um, so the one product is a super brew and it is a great creamer for your coffee. And what it has is it has um, grass fed butter, ghee, um, and uh, MCT oil powder. Sorry, it's just, it's thinking. That's why it's taking a long time to get to the- Yeah, it is a little bit slower. <laughs> um, so, and uh, what it is, is you've, if you've heard of Bulletproof Coffee before, um, mm -hmm. it's similar to that in that there's really good fats in there and it helps, um, it'll help with any of those gut issues. So the MCT oil is great. It's so good for brain health. It's good for gut health. It's good for so many things. So it's a dairy- um, it, it's not a lot of dairy because it's a it's a ghee product which is uh, filtered, um, and then we have the MCT boost with enhanced collagen. So um, I'm almost there. <laughs> um, the MCT boost is a, a little bit of collagen and uh, MCT oil powder. So those are really great to put in your coffee. I love them. Here we are. Um, I love them because um, they're easy to mix. They make it so creamy. The M MCT enhanced collagen creamers um, are dairy free. And the super brew on the left with the kind of a turquoise uh, container does have ghee in there, which is a clarified butter. So, um, and it has some MCT oil and um, in the grass fed butter. So it's, it's really, really good. And it's great to add your coffee. Great. Um, so this person doesn't drink coffee. How else, how else can they add the coffee creamer? What mm -hmm. can they do to... Yeah, people have added it to smoothies. They put it in tea. Um, they can use it in baking. Um, so many things. Yeah. Great. And it's a really good fat, right? So if you're looking to buffer that insulin spike, you can throw it in anything to just get more fats, right? Nice. Mm -hmm. Can a person use coconut oil rather than MCT? Is it the same benefits? Uh, yeah. So um, MCT oil is in coconut oil and it's um, extracted. It's like a really clean source from the coconut. So you could use both. You could use coconut oil too. There's lots of benefits to that. The MCT is a uh, medium chain triglycerides that's taken from the coconut oil. Um, but yes, you could use either or or both. Nice. Mm -hmm. You know what, Jolene? I think that might be it for our questions. Okay. Yeah. I want to see ones. Right? So many. I love it. That's what I love about our, our people is that 
there's always lots of great questions for sure. Yeah. So I wanted to thank you and I wanted to thank Organica. I think that Elisa's still there as well. She's uh, She was great at answering all the questions. <laughs> thank you, Elisa. That's great. Great job. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, so for those who are asking, yes, this, this presentation will be recorded and we're going to put it on our YouTube channel starting tomorrow once it becomes available. Um, for everyone that registered for this presentation, you'll get an email um, tomorrow morning with the link to it as well. And uh, I want to thank everybody for attending and we hope to see you at our Wellness Day sale. And that's next weekend, March 4th and 5th. All right. Take Thanks care, so everybody. Thank you Bye -bye. so much for having us, Nature's Fair. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nature's Fair, Melissa. I'm like, where is that noise coming from? <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks again.